There were many pivotal battles in World War II that led to final victory. But there's one that's generally ignored, which is most vital. The Battle of the Atlantic had to be won at all costs. Without victory here, the victory of the Battle of Britain and Operation Dynamo would have been to no avail, and D-Day couldn't have happened. The merchant seamen who took part in it go mostly unsung. When they're off duty in a pub, they could look like shirkers not doing their duty. It's not like that smart airman in his uniform. But 50,000 Allied seamen lost their lives during the war. At the outbreak of war, the French and British tried to blockade the German ports. That wasn't very effective. Most of the German Navy was out to sea, especially the U-boats and the Graf Spee. At the outbreak of war, Germany had 57 U-boats, 37 of which could go into the Atlantic. Within hours of declaration of war, U-30 sunk the Athena, which was a passenger ship. Before the fall of France, German ships had to go around the top of Denmark and then the top of Scotland to get to the Atlantic. But after the fall of France, they could operate from the Atlantic coast of France. Britain depended on the Atlantic crossings to get supplies. Britain needed a million tons of supplies per week to survive. It was Germany's intent to starve Britain into submission. And the German Navy command wanted to do this using their surface vessels. But Admiral Donitz, who commanded the submarines, thought the submarines were to do the job. It turned out he was right. He wanted 300 submarines. But fortunately, Hitler didn't make them fast enough. Churchill said, the only thing that really frightened me during the war was a U-boat threat. That was even greater threat than the glorious battle that turned out to be the Battle of Britain. For this video, we concentrate on the weapons of the Allies and the Germans and the tactics they used. The second video will mention the incredible way that the British found out the vital tactics to come to victory. In September 39, U-boats sunk 41 ships. The British believed they could counter U-boat threat by the convoy system and the ASDEC. Now this was quite effective, but the number of ships was still rising. Of the 2,700 merchant vessels sunk by submarines, 30% were in convoys, 60% were out of convoys, and the other 10% were stragglers from convoys. Patrols of warships were sent out into the Atlantic to find new boats. Then it was discovered that the best way to find new boats is next to convoys. And the convoys were escorted by destroyers, frigates, and corvettes. They are armed with guns and depth charges. Detecting the submarine is difficult if it's on the surface somewhere away. It has a very low profile. Underwater, it could be de detected by what was called the ASDIC, which is acronym for Anti-Submarine Detection Investigation Committee. Now, the committee never existed, but never mind, that, that was the name. Now, it's become the sonar. ASDIC was initially effective at a range of 2,000 yards, but then it was increased to three nautical miles. It had to be used in conjunction with a hydrophone. The ASDIC sent out a bit of uh, sound frequency, between 14 to 22 hertz. And if it struck something, the echo could be heard by the hydrophone. The ASDIC would sweep in an arc as it sent out the pings, just like an air radar does. And when you got an echo, it could be a submarine, or it could be a shoal of fish. An experienced ASDIC operator would know the difference. If a submarine had dived because it had been seen, it could now only move slowly, and it was blind. But the submarine had a hydrophone too, so they could hear the ping of the detector. This scenario has been used in Hollywood films often. You imagine the crew of the submarine tensely listening for the ping as the destroyer approaches. Now, if the destroyer picked up a ping and headed for the submarine, it wouldn't necessarily end in a kill. Now the ping was going out the front of the boat and the depth charges had to be dropped off the back, otherwise you'd risk blowing yourself up. And so once they crossed where they thought the submarine was, 
they weren't sure where it was and they just hoped the depth charges would hit it. So depth charges were dropped in a line out the back of the ship as it went forward and others were launched across the sides. Now the Aztec didn't tell you the depth of the submarine, so the depth charges were set to go off at different depths. They didn't have to hit the submarine, uh, they were effective within 20 foot of the submarine. Now water is practically incompressible, so when the charge went off, the shock was transmitted through the water onto the hull of the submarine. Now when the charge went off, there'd be a spume of water up into the air. If it was white, that meant you'd missed. If it was black, that meant there was a hit. After initial success of the submarines, the number of ships sunk went into decline, but then it started to rise steeply. The Aztec was effective against submarines underwater, but couldn't detect them on the surface. So the submarines changed tactics and started to attack at night on the surface. And they couldn't be seen and they could be detected. On the surface, they could move faster and outmaneuver the ships of the convoy. And once France fell, Germany had another advantage. The U-boats were now operating from ports on the coast of France, so they could spend more time in the Atlantic. In the summer of 1940, Donitz adopted the Wolfpack tactic. You'd have from 5 to 20 submarines spread out in a line across the normal path of convoys. When one submarine detected a convoy, you'd call up the others. So they'd group around it to start attacking. And the message sent out would be to other submarines, but also to Kriegsmarine HQ in France, and it also be picked up by monitors in Britain. As well as ship escorts, the convoys were accompanied by aircraft. They could fly out from Newfoundland, from Iceland, or from Britain, and attack submarines. Their advantage would be more maneuverable. Of course, their limitation was the range. And once they got to the halfway through the range, that to turn back. This left a gap in the middle of the Atlantic called the Black Pit, when they couldn't have air support and the submarines could act without being molested by airplanes. Now the planes didn't have to really attack the submarines, just their presence would make them dive. And once the submarine had dived, it was very slow and it was blind. And so the convoy could carry on without being molested for some time. The U-boat could only spend a few hours underwater on its batteries. The first aircraft used was a B-24 Liberator, which RAF Bomber Command had refused to use as its exhaust was too visible at night for night raids into Germany. The other planes used were Sunderland seaplanes and Whitley bombers and Catalinas. The Catalina had the longest range of 800 miles. Now, this period was called the happy time for the German submarines because they were sinking so many ships. And because there was another one later on, it became known as the first happy time. Despite the convoy system, the number of ships being sunk was rising steeply. Then the tide started to turn and the British had more success in combating the U-boats. Liberators had extra fuel tanks added, making them VLR, very long range. This reduced the size of the Black Pit. The plane flies much faster than ships, so the plane would patrol around the convoy until it was halfway through its range, then they had to head home. They still had difficulty in detecting new boats, as the U-boat would dive before the airmen could see it. Then the ASV was introduced. That's air-to-surface vessel radar. Now this could detect a submarine at around 5 miles and larger ships from 12 miles. As the aircraft approached the target, the operator had to change the frequency to adapt to the range. When they got within 1,000 yards, the detector didn't work anymore because of the interference from the waves. But if it was daylight, hopefully they could now see the submarine and attack it with depth charges. So the U-boats changed tactics. They started attacking at night when the VLR planes couldn't see them. So then they attached spotlights to the planes 
but that wasn't very effective either because the light could be seen a long way and the submarine would dive. So then the lay light was introduced. Now this was a very powerful lamp with a focusing lens and it was attached to the liberators. Now the lamp was heavy and to make it work, it needed a heavy generator. So that's where it's a big plane. Now the, they didn't have to turn the lay light on as they were approaching. They detect the submarine with the ASV and approach it. They'd have to change frequency as they approached. And then when they were about 500 yards away, the detector didn't work anymore. But the lamp was already pointing to where the detector had seen the submarine. Then they'd turn the lamp on, the lay light, and hopefully the submarine would be lit up and they could attack it. And the kill rate of submarines went up drastically. Now, Donitz introduced another countermeasure to this. They had a Metox machine, which could detect radars. So they'd have these in submarines. Now, if the submarine was near a convoy ship surrounded by escorts, there'd be lots of radars working. But as I mentioned, when the plane with the ASV was approaching the submarine, the operator would change frequency to change the range. Now the METOX operator could hear the change in the frequency. So they'd be hearing radars around them. But then when one changed frequency, they'd know they'd been detected and the plane was heading for them. So they'd dive. But then in late 42, the kill rate went up again. The Germans had been using the Enigma machine for encrypting messages from the beginning of the war. And the British, with the help of Poles, had been working on deciphering the codes with growing success. The Enigma machine code is, in theory, unbreakable. The message would be typed on a keyboard. The impulse from the key went through a series of three wheels with 26 letters on them. Before sending the message, the operator would set the cogs to a key code and then start typing the message. So you might type an A and the impulse would be sent through the cogs and it come back again through the cogs. And behind the keyboard, there was another like a keyboard, but just lights with letters on. And a different letter would light up. You might tap an A and the end would light up. But then later on, if you tapped an A in the message, a different letter would light up because each time you tapped a letter, one of the cogs would turn. Now, to make it even more difficult to break, there weren't just three cogs with the machine. There were five cogs in the box. And for the code of the day for the operator, it would tell them which of these cogs to put in, in which sequence, and then which letters to set them to. And then another complication was in front of the machine, there were cables to connect different sockets. So there were trillions of combinations. But the Germans got pretty sloppy in the way they used it. If the British monitors knew where the message came from, or who it came from, there'd be the name of the person at the bottom. So that would give them a start. There was a date included, and there would often be the place that it was sent from. So the clues like this, gave them a start and brought down the remaining number of combinations to thousands instead of trillions. So that's how they managed to start breaking the code. Of course, later on, they developed the bomb, which did it automatically. But the story of Enigma will be another video. So Bletchley Park was reading German messages as they were sent. And the U-boat commander, when he sent his message, would have to give his position. Otherwise, the other submarines couldn't find him. And so deciphering the messages allowed them to know where the submarine was. But with the kill rate rising fast, Donitz couldn't understand why. Now, the British went to great lengths to confuse the Germans by giving false information under Operation Bodyguard. Now, in this instance, it was just a lone commander who devised a plan on his own. Now, this commander of Coastal Command, he'd been captured and under interrogation, he told the Germans that the British had developed a detector for detectors. And it was completely false. But the Germans believed him 
even though they're surprised. And they actually went to the lengths of making a detector for the Metox. And it worked. So Admiral Donitz told all the submarines to turn off their Metox detector. As submarines could be located without Bletchley Park deciphering messages. It could just be by triangulation. And with ships picking up messages, airplanes and land-based monitors pick them up, they could triangulate and see where the submarine was. So when the Germans realized this was happening, they countered it by recording the message on a magnetic wire. And then they send out the message. It just be a, a second or so. It's like a blip. And then when the person who received it, they would record the message and then slow it down so they could listen to it. But the Allies could still triangulate because the monitoring stations, the ships, the aircraft and the land based stations, they were sending in reports of what they heard. And they get these reports at a certain time. We heard this strange blip and it was from this direction. And the ships and aircraft would report the same thing at the same time. So they could still triangulate to find the submarine. Another development of the convoy system was to have patrols of warships not attached to convoys. Now, if a convoy was attacked, they'd call up on these group of warships and they'd come to the assistance. They might think, well, the time the submarines attacked a ship, it's too far to come. They'd be there too late. But these battles with submarines lasted several days. And one submarine would detect the convoy. He'd call up the other submarines. Submarine would attack a merchant ship and then dive. And then another submarine would attack another merchant ship. And the whole thing would last for several days. So these patrol ships had time to come to the assistance. And that would double the number of escort ships for a convoy. Now the British had a weapon for some time. They didn't realize how useful it could be. And that was called the Hedgehog. And the Hedgehog was a bank of mortars that could fire all together. And they could put this on the front of a ship and they'd be following it with the ASDIC. When they got to where the submarine was, they could fire all these mortars, which would go down into the sea. Now these had to hit the submarine, but with a big batch of them going down and with the ASDIC guiding the ship, they had a good chance of hitting it. Whereas with the depth charges, they had to go out the back of the ship and you'd lost contact with the ASDIC by then. You weren't sure exactly where the submarine might be. So this was pretty effective. A later improvement on the Hedgehog was the Squid. Now this was a three barreled mortar. Each mortar weighed 177 kilograms. Now the barrels weren't parallel, they'd be slightly angled to each other. And so the mortars would fall into the sea in a triangular shape. And they'd have two of these squids, so they'd make a diamond shape. Now with this squid, the kill rate compared with depth charges went up by nine times. Late in the war, the Allies started escorting convoys with aircraft carriers. So the aircraft could attack German aircraft and also submarines. And before that, they developed the camcraft system. That means catapult merchantmen for aircraft. Now the merchant ship would have a big girder fixed to the front, but it wouldn't be right parallel to the axe. It would be off an angle slightly. And on top of this girder would be a trolley fixed in place with a pin, and the trolley would have rockets attached to it. And then on top of the trolley would be a hurricane fighter plane. Now there'd be two pilots on the ship. Now if enemy aircraft came into view, one of the pilots would get into the hurricane the ship's crew would take out the pin from the trolley and they'd show it to the pilot so he knew that the trolley wasn't fixed now. And the ship would be turning to get into the wind. And then once the ship rose over a crest of a wave with the bows pointing upwards, the pilot would set off the rockets and he'd be launched into the air. Now this system always ended with at least one Condor or other plane being shot down even more if there were more planes. Now the flight for the hurricane was one way, they couldn't land, and they had to ditch. You might think the sacrificing hurricane just to knock down a condor 
wasn't a win situation. But the Condor had five crew in it, and the Condor would have sunk several merchant ships, so that was pretty effective. Now, only one pilot lost his life in the system, and all the planes were lost except one. One actually landed in Russia, so it was obviously on a Murmansk convoy. The success of these hurricanes once they're up in the air was because the hurricane was the only fighter plane in the air. And they were against the Condor, or other similar aircraft, which had been designed as an airliner and converted into a bomber. And the hurricane was loaded to the maximum with rockets, cannons and ammunition. But Condors did sink 350,000 tons of shipping. Another tool the Allies used later was the sonar buoy. Now these would be dropped in the sea near where submarines had been detected. Now it didn't send out a ping, it was just a passive listening device. Now if it detected a submarine, or if one of them did, and there'd be several dropped, it would send out a message to where the submarine was. Now the Germans couldn't intercept this message because they were using the spread spectrum. That means the message was broadcast on different frequencies. So if the Germans are listening in, they just hear a noise like interference. Whereas on the receiving end, they'd be listening to the different frequencies and they put the message together to see where the submarine was. So as these tools developed and the weapons, the British managed to reduce the number of ships sunk and put an end to the first happy time. Now the second happy time was surprisingly started when the Americans joined the war in the end of 41 and the beginning of 42. Now there's two reasons for this. One is there were many more ships crossing the Atlantic and the other was that Admiral King who commanded the US naval force in the Atlantic he didn't like the limeys and he wasn't going to take any advice from the British. The British suggested to the Americans that they should turn off their lighthouses and navigation buoys and impose a blackout along the Atlantic coast. But King was having none of that and they weren't going to use the convoy system either. So they send out a ship from New York and there'd be a submarine set out in the Atlantic and he could see the ship silhouetted against the Manhattan skyline and he'd sink it and then another ship would come out and it would get sunk. Now 25% of all ships sunk during the war were sunk during this period, which the Germans called Cophead. And the second happy time sunk twice as many ships as the first happy time. It would take a year before the British could come up with tactics to overcome the menace of the submarines. And that would be another video. So thanks for watching to the end. If you haven't already, tap the subscribe button plus the bell and give a thumbs up. So we'll see you soon.